everybody. This is Life Lessons with Mikey Messier. If you're listening to the audio version on the Wrestling with the Future podcast network, uh, I am Mike Messier. I am here in Florida. My buddy, Jimmy Faluca. Jimmy, did I say your last name right? You said it perfectly, sir. Thank you. Very good. And Jimmy, <laughs> you're in the Northeast. Can you, can you give us a, a certain area that you're in? Do you want to disclose I that? I am in Staten Island, New York, sir. One of the five boroughs of New York. Nice. The closest I think I've been there was Long Island. How far is Staten Island from Long Island? It's a pretty, if you're going to drive there, it's a pretty long drive. I remember once because of my job, I had to drive out there once with some coworkers. See, I work at Staten Island Hospital and our Northwell Health, one of our main corporation buildings is in Long Island. We all had to go out there once. And let me tell you something, the traffic was murder. I don't wish it on. If you want to give someone a really bad day, have them yeah. drive out to Long Island because the traffic <laughs> alone will drive them nuts. The last time and really the first time I was at uh, Long Island was to visit in the summer of 2018, uh, right around this time two years ago. I visited a guy named Brian Danovich. Uh, Brian Dano was the toughest man on Tough Enough, the class with Miz and Ryback. And long story short, if you remember, he was the guy that blew out his chest muscle doing an excessive amount of bench pressing really quick. Ooh. And uh, they, they they actually put him uh, in Ohio Valley. And he had, like, uh, Carl Anderson in his class there in Ohio Valley. And um, But Dano, uh, unfortunately, about a month after I hung out with him, he passed away. Oh. So it was horrible because I, I met this guy at his home. And uh, he had the whole world ahead of him. But I think he was one of those guys that didn't realize that maybe the best was yet to come. And when I do podcasts and when I talk wrestling, to be honest, I, I don't dwell on it. But sometimes I do in that I feel like Dano was a guy, a young guy in his mid-30s who loved wrestling so much, had his opportunity, had his shot with Tough Enough. Uh, the injury never really healed up properly. And they were still kind of putting him through the paces of Ohio Valley. And he was still pretty much injured. And he just never got that brass ring. And he was always kind of floating around hoping for it. And he, he, you know, 10 years later, he found himself doing these podcasts and he interviewed Hannibal. And I think he, he interviewed some other people of note. Um, I think he talked to uh, Sean Mooney among others and people liked him, but he always kind of had that. I want to be in the elite. I want to be in the WWE, not, not uh, the Cody Rhodes elite, but the WWE elite. I got an idea what you meant. Yeah. Yes. Well, unfortunately, and I've discovered this in my 11 years in my vocation, a lot of times when you're down, you can't see that you could only go up. Like there right. was a time period from about two years ago, it was right after my son was born, where I was going through some troubles at my job. And let me tell you something. When you're 27, 28 years old and you're coming home every day with chest pains from stress, it'll knock you on your ass physically and mentally. But I was fortunate that I had an excellent support system around me, family and very close friends that were like, listen, you're going to get through this. Once you get over this hump, start planning for the future. And let me tell you something. Professionally, I can't remember the last time I was this happy. So, you know, it's at that time when you're going through the depression, you're going through the downtime, you're going through the sadness. It's hard to see the forest for the trees. It's hard to see that sun peeking out over the horizon. But, right. man, let me tell you, for anyone that's actually listening to this, if you're going through that right now, believe me, when you're down, you can only go up. And let me tell you, if, you're, if, you, if you believe in yourself enough and, and you work hard enough, believe me, you can go far in life. I'm living proof. I'm living proof you can do it. Well, you, you're a family man. You've got, uh, if you, I don't know how much you want to talk about that, but you, you've got yourself a nice family going on there, right? Yeah. Let me tell you something. I, I could not ask for a, for a better family. I have great, great parents. They're, they're my rock. They've been my, they've been my, the blood pumping through my chest for, for my whole life. I have an excellent sister who's basically my best friend. You know, we're always together. We're always hanging out. She's actually the godmother to my son. And nice. forget it, that kid, ever since he started talking, one of his first words was her name. He oh, wow. follows her around all the time. And I have a beautiful wife. You know, she's she's absolutely awesome. She's been with me since 2011. And, uh, you know, we're coming up next year. will be 10 years that she and I are well, together. Congratulations. Got, yeah, thank you. We got married in 2017. Believe it or not, she actually picked the wedding date on my for, for it to be on my father's birthday. Because that's oh. how that's how close her and my dad are. So that's really cool. We, we, we're a very tight knit family over here. So, 
you know, personally, I've got a good life. I have no complaints. Now, what what I wanted to talk about with you tonight, Jimmy, and and you and I have kind of known each other through these Facebook circles uh, for a couple of years. And and just real quick, I want to give a, a shout out to our sponsor, uh, Manscaped. Uh, Manscaped is a men's gro- grooming product. And what it's really good for, Jimmy, uh, is basically men's grooming. Now, what, you know, people might be wondering, what's that? Well, it's basically between the waistline and the knee. And I won't <laughs> I'll let people's imagination. <laughs> Don't got to elaborate further. We yeah, get right. Yeah. <laughs> so so the, uh, the promo code Wrestling Future gets you 20% off all your purchases. And what they have is the, the Lawnmower 3.0, the Razor. They have all these wonderful um aromas and gels and all these wonderful things and they're branching out into some new products and the reason why this is important really is kind of the health reason if nothing else it's the summer it's the heat and in that area if people are not well groomed they're more susceptible in my opinion to ingrown hairs and all types of nasty stuff so you want to keep yourself nice and trim they're and all that good stuff a lot of, they're prone to a lot of other things you don't realize how important hygiene and cleanliness is most people and I've said this for years, the most unsung heroes in all the cities are the sanitation workers. Because if it wasn't for them, our city was our cities would be filled with, with pestilence, with disease, and trash all over the place. And the That's human right. body is no different. If you the women have to do maintenance more than we do most of the time, but we still have to do it. So you're promoting something that's really useful. Whether guys want to admit it or not, you gotta take care of yourself. That's right. Thank you. Thank you, Jimmy. And Manscaped, M-A-N-S-C-A-P-E-D dot com. And the promo code Wrestling Future gets you 20% off. If you are going to go and get some Manscaped stuff, make sure you use our promo code. So the good folks, uh, Kyle and everybody else at Manscaped knows that we are speaking good on their behalf. Uh, and thank- a nice t-shirt you got on, Mike. Thank you. This is the Wrestling with the Future podcast t-shirt. Appreciate that. Our good host and producer who uh, gets this show everywhere, all the audio uh, versions. And Jimmy, this guy, Angelo, Psychic Medium, he's up in the uh, New Jersey area. He's really working hard to broadcast all these shows. Uh, Life Lessons, uh, which is my show, uh, The Ref's Roundtable, which is in honor of Jeff the Ref Robinson, who passed away on February 29th of this year. Uh, The yeah, he was a good guy. The main, the flagship, uh, Wrestling with the Future. And um, I know you have been on the show before uh, with Angelo a, a couple of times, but I, I, a reason why I wanted to talk to you, I'm kind of fascinated by you, Jimmy, in a low-key way, is because you have been doing, uh, to give him credit, the One Wrestling Network group has been around for a while. And I always associate that with uh, The Ultimate Warrior. And I know a lot of people don't like The Ultimate Warrior, and I can understand why he, he, yeah, he had some, he had some, so, some offensive and controversial things, but he was cool to me when I met him. And, um, but my thing is this, you do these kind of fantasy bookings and one of the characters you're really kind of fascinated with and always feeling that's being misused, uh, misdialed. They're not tuned in. Vince McMahon is, is uh, look, I think Vince McMahon is having, uh, age issues to be honest with you. <laughs> And and I, I don't say that to make fun of him. I just think it's true. So when we're talking about Bray Wyatt, the last time I saw him was Sunday night on pay-per-view. He's wrestling in the Swamp match. And my feeling was this. I thought the Bray Wyatt-John Cena match at WrestleMania was an art house film. I enjoyed it. But now that we're going to the well, like the fourth or fifth time with this cinematic match experience, and it's the Swamp match, Bray Wyatt versus Braun Strowman, and they did like kind of the clockwork orange tie you down to a chair and yell at you and and all that stuff. What did you think of the swamp match in particular, Jimmy? What did you think of it? Well, I personally am not a fan of the cinematic style matches. I don't feel that they really have a place in pro wrestling because pro wrestling is meant to take place in the ring surrounded by fans. I don't want to get too deep into this. I don't want to consume our time. But I personally think WWE and all other wrestling promotions, let's not leave the rest out, could have benefited from taking a much-needed hiatus and, you know, cracking down, spending that time to come up with some interesting stories that people would want to be interested in. Because as fascinated as I might be with the Bray Wyatt character or some other characters like a Keith Lee or an Aleister Black, the WWE is doing record low ratings. 
Nobody's watching, even though they're all stuck home for the most part. So that means that even though the fans are stuck home, they're not watching. They just pulled a 1.1 Nielsen rating. That is horrendous compared to six years ago, where they had six, where where they had they did I think it was a 4.4. That's a 65 percent decrease. That's massive. So I watched the Swamp match, not going to lie, because I will watch the pay-per-views here and there if there's a match I'm interested in. And I was interested really in just seeing what they were going to do with the Wyatt character and Braun Strowman, because I did feel a few years ago he, they could have done something with him, even though I wasn't a fan. I recognized that he was popular. Um, you know, Bray is good in those cinematic-type presentations because I feel that his character is really out of a it's out of a horror story his character's out of a horror story so he might benefit from that I'll never accuse him of being a great in-ring worker he's not gonna he's not gonna give you a, a Briscoe Funk classic sure but you know for his character it was interesting it was different um did I really understand how to win no because they never clarified that because there's never been a precedent for something like this so, as I mentioned, I liked it for what it was, but if I, I would much rather see these guys in the ring with an arena filled with fans. So, I enjoyed the match for what it was, but at the same time, I looked at it and said, as cool as this might be to some people, for, for the most part, it's going to be looked at as another cinematic match that really wasn't necessary. They should be on a hiatus, in my view. Okay, well, that's that's a good point. And like you said, that would be a whole other spear because I tend to agree and disagree with you, if, if that makes any sense. I agree in that I personally feel that when this whole COVID thing started, if the WWE, let's just stick with them, and yeah. if they had gone on hiatus initially and said, hey, folks, NBA went on hiatus, NHL went on hiatus, we're going on hiatus, and use this time to let all the wrestlers heal up their injuries, mm -hmm. spend time with their family. Uh, you know, if, if any Just of the female, safe. yeah, be safe. If any of the females wanted to have a family, have a baby, they, they could have used that opportunity to experiment with that, uh, so to speak. And instead, the show must go on. You know, the WWE, the show went on, folks, right here in Florida. And for me... Once that decision was made, I'm willing to go with it because I think there have been some improvements in the product. For instance, some of these Edge interviews backstage, um, the Orton Edge match, the quote, greatest match ever quote, I thought just two things about that match bothered me was the collar and elbow tie up at the beginning with Edge and Orton. Mm -hmm. But I, right, the, the under the camera shot, everything else I kind of liked. So, my feeling was, is once they've made that decision, the show must go on. Kind of like the Saudi Arabian thing. No one's more opposed to the Saudi Arabian shows than me. But once you've decided to do it, okay, we got Natalia Neidhart versus Lacey Evans. Uh, we got this guy, uh, Mansoor, wrestling on 205 Live. So once they decide to do it, if you let them go down that path, then you have to see the pluses and minuses of going down that route. Fair that enough. Yeah. So, so that being said, with this Swamp match, the way that I cope with WWE now, Jimmy, is is I watch on one computer and I'm doing something else on another computer at the same time. If 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 I were to sit there with a TV and a bucket of popcorn and just watch WWE, I don't think I could get through it. Um, but what I've noticed about you is you put a lot of time and energy into what I call the fantasy booking. And I've listened to some of your fantasy booking sessions and I've jo enjoyed them. Uh, but my question for you is, can you share with us, the, the Wrestling with the Future podcast audience, who maybe have never heard you before, what do you think they could have done with Bray? What are some of your ideas with Bray that you don't mind sharing with our audience? If you were the no, booker? I no, I don't mind at all. I mean, my philosophy when it comes to booking a talent that's less established, but obviously has the tools to be something more, is to allow them to become something more. Uh, you take a character like Bray Wyatt, his first program on the WWE stage was with Kane. You don't have Kane beat him. You put Bray over. Why? Because Kane, number one, he was already a bona fide Hall of Famer long before he fought Bray. So it wasn't going to hurt Kane. Then they put him in there with the most popular wrestler that they had at the time and Daniel Bryan. And 
while I, as a fan of Daniel Bryan, may not have wanted to see him lose that program, the bottom line was it was the right decision. Because Bray Wyatt faced Daniel Bryan at the Royal Rumble, if you recall that match, I don't know if you do, but it was easily one of the best matches of the year. Now, yes, we could say Daniel Bryan, the great in-ring technician that he is, contribute to that more than Wyatt, but if you watch the match, the storytelling, the facial expressions, the, the need to do moves, the, re the reasoning to do moves, like they didn't just do a move just for the sake of doing it. No, there was a purpose behind it. Brian going through the middle of the ropes to do a suicide dive and Bray catches him and Sister Abigail's him into the, the Sister Abigail's him into the guardrail following up on the fact that Brian had a concussion a few weeks prior, you know, actually using the move for a specific reason because of capitalizing on the injury. And then you go the very next month to Elimination Chamber where it's the Wyatts versus the Shield. Neither of these groups are really established names. They're both still relatively new, and the crowd ate it up. Right. There wasn't a shit ton of false finishes, kicking out of finishing moves. It was just six young guys beating the crap out of each other. It told a story, and they put Wyatt over, which was the smart thing to do. Because Reigns, they already knew they were going to try to do something with him, so there was no reason to sacrifice Bray. But then the wheels fell off at WrestleMania 30 when they had Bray Wyatt face the guy in John Cena who's been put over more than anyone else. And instead of actually, you know, um, taking what they were using in the match, which I thought was actually pretty smart at the time, where Bray introduced the steel chair into the match, you don't even have to have Bray beat him with the sister Abigail. Have Cena use the steel chair on Bray Wyatt, get disqualified, so that way the people that don't identify with him can say, you know what, Bray got in his head. He screwed with him. He lost it. Or have Cena not used the chair, be distracted, get hit with the sister Abigail. You know what, he couldn't bring himself to use the chair. I respect that. But you still don't damage the character. And I'm going to use one of their head writers as an example in Bruce Pritchard. In one of the WWE recent documentaries where they talked about Kane's debut, well, we have Shawn Michaels and The Undertaker. They're fighting inside Hell in a Cell. We can't have either one really beat the other, so we have to make sure that they stay whole. Well, why wasn't it a priority to keep Bray Wyatt whole? Instead, they had John Cena beat him in a glorified three-on-one handicap match with both Harper and Rowan interfering, and then it gets even worse with the next month where they're having a steel cage match. All three of those guys couldn't beat John Cena. It takes a fourth member of the Wyatt family, which was a little kid singing a voice in a gargled voice. It takes four people to beat him. And then we go to Payback, which is the which was the finish to the feud, and Cena beat him clean as a whistle. And you know what? That was the beginning of the end. People could say that that was used for storyline purposes, but if you actually dissect his career, right. that was the beginning. You know this as well as I do, sir. Once they get comfortable with beating you, it's over. Because what happened at the next year's WrestleMania? Yes, people could say he wrestled The Undertaker, but the Undertaker, who no longer had the streak, which I still argue was a major mistake, because nothing positive came out of it. Did Bray need to lose that match? The Undertaker streak was already over. It was done. No harm would have came to the Undertaker if he would have done the job for Wyatt. And then you go to the year. Then you could even go months later at the Survivor Series, where Wyatt and Harper wrestled Taker and Kane. Did Taker and Kane have to win that match? They were both already. First ballot Hall of Famers. It wasn't necessary. Then you go to WrestleMania 32, where The Rock is having a segment. Here comes the Wyatts. You're thinking, oh, they're going to give Wyatt some shine. It'll take all no, three. They, take they were sacrificial lambs in he that was case. Sacrificial lamb. You tell me you right. couldn't send Heat Slater out for that? You're right. going to send a guy who's obvious, who's actually got some talent, has some promise, and you're going to sacrifice him to The Rock when you could send the jobbers out there for that? And then you go to WrestleMania 33. You know, right or wrong, Randy Orton's done so many things in his career that warrant that he lose his job. Drugs, shitting in other wrestlers' bags, the bullying backstage, the abuse of his power. Please see Kofi Kingston. Please see Mr. Kennedy. He faces Bray Wyatt after winning the Rumble, which I'm still trying to figure out why Orton needed to win the Rumble in 2017 when he was already a first ballot Hall of Famer. And not only does Bray win the belt, but less than a month later, he loses it to Orton. And think about this. They took the belt off Bray just so that Orton could lose it to Jinder Mahal because he found some secret sauce that they didn't have a proper drug test for. That's the way I look at it. So my issue with the way they booked Wyatt is if you're not going to put him over, 
don't put him up against those established names because all you're doing is putting a ceiling on him that the casual audience will see because they don't give a damn about me or you because we've been watching wrestling our whole lives. They care about the casual audience. Right. Well, if you care about the casual audience, you have to validate all of those characters that are going to lead this company into the future in the eyes of those fans. You can't do that and then beat them against named talent. And I ask a simple question to those that would oppose me. Why is it okay for Roman to beat The Undertaker? Why is it okay for him to beat John Cena? Why is it okay for him to beat Randy Orton? But Bray Wyatt can't. I don't understand this. Especially, they're going to say, all oh, the ratings, the merchandise. When at both times that Roman got the belt, the ratings tanked. You could ask any of the guys on the page. Didn't, right? didn't Bray this. Wyatt once have the top merchandise? Wasn't he the top merchandise guy at one point? Bray Wyatt? He currently is right now, sir. Okay, so Jimmy, let me ask you this. And and look, this is from one hardcore wrestling fan to the other. Do you, uh, life, did you ever aspire? Do you still aspire to work for the WWE as a writer? Did you ever apply? No, sir. I have no desire to ever work for the WWE because I understand that it's an environment where they write for an audience of one. They don't write for the actual audience. They write for one old individual in the back. If I thought for a single second that they were actually going to write for an audience... I would have no problem applying for a creative position. And I have a feeling I'd knock a few people off. I'd knock a few socks off because booking wrestling is not difficult. If you put your ego aside, you could write some great stuff. See, if I was a writer, I wouldn't just book Bray to win all his matches. You know, you could ask any of the guys on the page. I was going to do a video before I took a break from the page on who I would have booked to be the first guy to beat The Fiend. And it actually would have made sense. And it actually would have made a star. I wouldn't have just fed him to a guy that was in his prime when I was seven years old. No, that was ridiculous and it was stupid. That's why they get, and they get the backlash that they get because Ray Charles Blind is a back concede that that was a bad decision. Not just because I don't want to see why it lose. That's ridiculous. Everyone loses in wrestling. Some more than others. Sure. But, but the point I'm trying to make is when you're going to beat a character that is gaining steam, there's got to be a reason for it. There's got to be a storyline purpose for it. There's got to be an actual reason. It's no different than Asuka, not to get off topic, but when Asuka lost her undefeated streak to Charlotte, I was still sitting there. I'm still to this day scratching my head wondering, why did this happen? What was the purpose? Mania was two and a half years ago. Yeah, I'm still, I still can't understand what was the purpose. What, pos what, what positive factor came out of that? And... I'm going to quote my former co-host, Frank, because it's a very smart statement to make. If you have a match that doesn't benefit either person, you don't do it. It's very easy, sir. Here's a here's a, my take on their take on it, which is why a woman like Charlotte Flair wins matches that, you know, we think she probably should have lost, whether it's Oscar at Mania or why did Charlotte probably have a 60 or 70% winning advantage over Sasha Banks once they got to the main roster. My hey, opinion is is you. that Vince McMahon in particular, and I don't say I agree with him, but I'm saying that this is what I think he thinks or how he thinks, is that the fans want to have certain bookings that they disagree with because the hate watch is a part of it. Like if we if we piss the fans off by having Charlotte beat Asuka, they're going to tune in Monday night on Raw after Mania to see what happens next. So there's a certain amount of booking that's done. Even a Jinder Mahal would be a very radical case if we they they're really going to hate this, and if they really hate it, they're going to be forced to watch our show to see how we make up for it. Now, the problem is when they don't make up for it. The problem is when they continually to give us bookings that we disagree with. And I'd say that, you know, after three or four years of being the angry wrestling fan and doing videos about mm. that on YouTube, I think my own raw protest has proven to be correct. The, look at all these. Yeah. Look at all these fans that are leaving, you know, and, and for the first year or two of the raw protest, people say, Oh, Mike, you're full of shit. No one watches your videos. No one cares. Well, obviously whether, people do. Obviously, uh, people do. Not giving uh, your, your not giving your protest one hundred and fifty percent credit for people leaving, but I have no doubt that people have seen that video, have actually sat and thought about it, because you're right. There probably is some sort of logic behind. Oh, if we piss them off enough, they'll want to tune in to see this happen. Well, I would counter Vince McMahon with this: 
if you didn't have more people tuning in after you ended the Undertaker's undefeated streak to see Brock get his, you're not going to piss them off to want to watch anything. Because you would think, and Jim Ross described this perfectly, Brock was basically Bruce Dern that night. He shot John Wayne in the back. Right. And there was really, you know, the ratings continued to go down. And here we are in 2020. They're approaching that 1.0 margin. And I've been asking this question for years, and maybe you can answer this for me. Sure. When do you hit the panic button? When do you finally say, okay, we need to change something here, or we're going to lose everything? I think they they should have been pushing that panic button a long time ago is the answer. Agreed. And uh, the gentleman, Vinny, on the uh, Brian Alvarez discussion, a, 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 a Simpavini or something is his name, he okay. was saying about three or four months ago, when the ratings were, were bad, but not quite this bad, he was <laughs> saying similar to what you just said, which is uh, Alvarez was saying, hey, I think the ratings have hit the low point and they're just going to stay here at a 1.5 or a 2. And Mike Simpavini was saying, no, they can get worse. And he's yeah. been proven correct. They have gotten worse. And this counter uh, argument that some folks have that it's because of DVDRs or it's because of YouTube TV or because people watch highlights on YouTube, mm -hmm. that, that's a part of it. But the thing is, not that many people a week go out and get a DVDR or YouTube TV or watch clips on YouTube that didn't the week before. <laughs> there, there's oh, such. Now, when you lose sixty five percent of your audience in le in less than six years, it's not the cord cutting, it's not the YouTube, it's not the virus, it's you, and you right. have. And the first step, you you know this because you're a highly intelligent individual. The first step to fixing a problem is admitting you have one. I right. don't think that they've reached that stage because they think we're swimming in money. It doesn't matter that people aren't watching. We're the WWE. We're going to exist forever. That's Triple H told Carl Anderson. We're going to be here forever. You sure you want to sign with AEW? And I, and I sat there and I heard that statement. Well, they're that arrogant that they think that they're too, they're too big to fail. That's like too fat to diet. It's not true. It's not true. Right. No business is too big to fail. None. Look at Toys R Us and look at Sears. Come on. Sure. Hey, well, RC Cola was once the number one, number three cola in the company uh, in the country. Now this this is going to segue uh, because we're coming up on the half hour mark. Okay. So what I want to do, Jimmy, is I, I want to see if you can stick around for a second episode back to back. Sure, I can. Sure, and what we're going to do is we're going to segue into our next topic, which is we've established that you and I both know the problems of the WWE creatively. Yeah. Other people do as well. These Facebook groups, whether it's the Wrestling with the Future podcast, the group that you and I think uh, Frank started, the One Wrestling Network page. Um, you and Good yep. old. Yep. Sh Shane McKenna's wrestling fans. Uh, my buddy Neil Jones has a nice group in your head wrestling, uh, wrestle talk, all these, all these, I'm in, I'm in like 20 or 30 groups, just join pro wrestling uncensored pro wrestling and MMA extreme. And, and, and although I've been playing the heel for a couple of years in these groups, my point is to always educate and always say to these other wrestling fans, Hey, if you're 35 years old, you're 25 years old and you haven't sat down and given yourself three and a half hours to watch Starcade 1983, or the highlights of the Crockett Cup 87, or if you haven't even watched WrestleManias 1, 2, and 3, what are you waiting for? You know, because these are some of the, the foundational episodes of what the modern-day sports entertainment is. No, now, absolutely, especially that Starcade event. I mean, Ricky Steamboat and Jay Youngblood going up against the Briscoes. You got that freaking dog collar match with Valentine and Piper. One yep. of the best, one of, to me, one of the most underrated matches that I've ever seen. Of course, the cage match with, with Flair and Harley Race, where Harley passed the torch to Flair. Now, just a quick question, because I'm you. I figure you might know the answer. Do we know why the U.S. title wasn't on the line in that dog collar match? That's a good because question. Uh, because uh, both of them went over to the WWF shortly thereafter. They put the U.S. title on Dick Slater shortly after that match. I think it was because they knew Piper was leaving. Oh, and they, okay. And, and they didn't want to give him the belt, so they got it to Dick Slater. Hey, Jimmy, we're going to wrap up this episode. On the next episode of Life Lessons with Mike and Jimmy, we're going to discuss how the wrestling affects us as fans and if we're putting too much emotions into it. So this is Mike Messier with Jimmy Faluca, and we'll see you on the next episode. Come back for round two.